Let me start with, with, with a sort of um, obvious and yet inevitable question. Um, it, it seems to me that people do not come to Leonard Cohen as they do to, say, the Beatles or, or even someone like Bruce Springsteen. There's always, there's always an origin story or a creation myth with, with becoming a Cohen fan. T tell me yours. Well, mine is probably different from a, a bunch of American creation myths because Leonard became very popular very quickly in the UK, where he was treated as a god from the first album on. I believe in Norway they have churches to him at the very minimum. But, so across Europe, you know, we, we somehow related to that, that darkness, the humour that was in the darkness, you know, the gallows humour that was in there, and just the general misery of it all. It just seemed natural to the British, you know, dark misery. But my personal story was that uh, I was a little Beatle fan, and uh, I loved music. So I bought this because it was a price of a single, for those who remember, 45s. And I got it with my pocket money. And for some reason or other, hearing Leonard Cohen's voice singing Sisters of Mercy just picked me up and threw me against the wall. I should point out it was also the day I hit puberty. So I was in a sensitive state. <laughs> so yes, there was a story behind this. But I just love the music, and I do actually remember buying the album. I'd saved up my you know, like pocket money, and I bought this album, the first album, Songs of Leonard Cohen, with that black cover with this sepia, haunted-looking face, like a dead poet. And I thought, Jesus, he's ancient. <laughs> it, was really, it really freaked me out for a while. He didn't look like Paul McCartney. But uh, I love the music. Well, he was in his 30s <clears throat> by then. He was an old man. Yes, exactly. So that was my story. How about yours? Uh, it, it, it involves it involves drinking, uh, and it involves it involves the same moment. It involves puberty. Uh, it involves puberty, uh, and it involves that voice, uh, that that sort of um, kindly yet somewhat demonic, you know, voice sort of creeping towards you and and and, and uh, suggesting to you there that there is that there is another world. Um, so let me ask you about this world. You, you um, are, are you know, one of our more prominent rock journalists. You've interviewed uh, a lot of people. You have written uh, tremendous books about several of them that Gabe has mentioned. Can you place him, if, if you had to place Leonard Cohen in the sort of the, the pantheon of modern singer-songwriters, where does he belong? What is his tradition? Is he a, you know, a one-off? Is he a descendant, a disciple, a master? Where, where, where would you put him? He's definitely a one-off. I mean, there are people that come along that are templates. I mean, a lot of bands now will go into the studio and say, I want it to sound more like Leonard Cohen. <laughs> Leonard Cohen doesn't do that. That's usually the easy test for finding these people who are, who are one-offs. I've never been very good at rating people, which is crazy because uh, the magazine I write for in England called Mojo Magazine kind of has a habit of having, is this one better than that one? You know, top 10 mm. guitar players of all time. You know, for me, they often all tie for first place. Maybe that's a, a gender-specific thing, I'm not sure. But uh, it's, it's up there with the greats. I would say definitely on a level or sometimes above Bob Dylan in his lyricism and with his melodies, completely unique. One of the interesting things about playing the ukulele, I brought my ukulele up already, <laughs> and sitting there and learning to play his songs is, you know, if you play any kind of instrument, however lamely as you're here, I play mine, it's, you, you kind of have a feel for where a song is going to go, what chord is going to lead to the next one. With Leonard Cohen's songs, they don't go to that chord. They go somewhere entirely different, and they take it into a different space. And there's also an incredible amount of space in his songs. It's quite unique. It's wonderful for a singer because you can take four breaths between lines, mm. but it also gives this kind of element of airiness and somehow, I don't know, you know there's something up there and you have to look at it. There is this element of a cathedral in so many of his early songs. There's a great quote by him that, that I, I believe you cite in your book. He says something along the lines of, you know, the critics were always unfair to me. They said I only knew three chords, where in reality I knew five. Uh, so, so there's, there's actually, I agree with you, there, there's, mm -hmm. more, there's more musicality there. Uh, you mentioned the name that I, I think will forever be coupled with Cohen's own, which is Bob Dylan. And, and, and I know that sort of writing this book, you've, you've had the opportunity to think uh, about Dylan inspiring Cohen uh, to become, at, at the ripe age of 32, 33, uh, to, to become a, a singer-songwriter, and, and also about how the two pursued um, somewhat similar, if, if, if evidently very divergent paths. So 
T tell us about the Cohen Dillon nexus. Uh, how are they similar? How are they different? Well, actually, he has claimed that he wasn't inspired by Dillon. I think another biography seemed to think that he was, but um, from the way that Leonard told it, and it seemed to pan out from basic probing, you know, laser beam in his eyes and poking him with sticks, that he kept with the same story, which was that he really wasn't very aware of Dylan or any of the folk music. He knew they existed. He wasn't locked away in a cupboard or anything, but he was, um, you would be if you were in England. It's a national pastime. But uh, he lived on the Greek island of Idra from 1960 for a great length of time. He went back to Montreal periodically to get Canadian government grants. Isn't it lovely grants giving you money to write? And uh, As you said, what was a great phrase, uh, going back to Montreal to, to renew his anxieties? Yes, that's right, his neurotic, <laughs> exactly, his neuroses. But uh, he said that he was really just listening. The only, the only radio he listened to was the American Forces radio that came in to, to Greece, and it played country music. And when I asked him to kind of reel off the list of the albums that he had, the LPs that he owned, uh, there was Ray Charles doing his country album. There was Hank Williams. He, he could, George Jones, he could sing you a George Jones song just by pushing a button. Hit the boutonniere in the lapel, he'll sing you a George Jones song. Mm -hmm. But he really didn't know much about popular culture. And he decided he would become a, a songwriter, not a singer. He had no interest in singing. And I guess because he had the kind of lyrical poetry that had that rhythm that could translate into song, he thought, I'll go to Nashville and become a but songwriter. You, you, I have to interrupt you. You have to explain, and, and okay. obviously you do a very good job in the book, uh, but for the sake of the audience, this, this is a bizarre turn. Here he is. Mm -hmm. uh, he's in his 30s. He'd already written uh, at least three successful collections of, of poetry. He'd won awards, he's, he's a sort of a, a minor literary celebrity in Canada, he has written two novels, um, and, and here he is entering this, this game, which is populated by, by much younger men, and which is strange for someone who might have dabbled in music but was not a musician per se. Explain how he becomes a singer-songwriter. Well, he was back on the island of Heathrow, and he really didn't even have enough money to live in the very modest home he had, which had no electricity or running water. And I guess he was getting sick of going backwards and forwards to Montreal. And he just borrowed some money from a friend and decided that he would just see if he could become a songwriter in Nashville. And a friend of his in Canada said, I know a woman who lives in New York named Mary Martin, who actually had worked with Bob Dylan's The Band. She knew them before they were the band, and she put them together with Bob Dylan because she'd been working as Bob Dylan our manager, Albert Grossman's executive assistant. She had since gone independent, and she, uh, she liked helping Canadians, and so he went, with, went to her with a few songs he'd written, including Suzanne and the Stranger Song, and she said, well, I'll put you together with Judy Collins. She's always looking for songs to cover. She doesn't write her own songs. And so they got together, she covered Suzanne, and on the back of that, he thought, well, okay, I've got offered this record deal. Back then, they were very generous with record deals, you know? <laughs> you know, everybody was getting a record deal. And he got a record deal and, um, you know, was not really very well pleased with that. He really did want to be a, a, song, a songwriter and not a singer. How do you explain the discrepancy in reception? between Europe and here, you said before that, you know, ba back home he's, he's revered and, and the cathedrals and all that. Uh, back here he has had, uh, this, this may come as somewhat of a shock to, to the people in this room who are, who are obviously fans, but he had his first uh, top 10 album uh, in America was his most recent one at the age of 77. He's, he's never done uh, extremely well and, and some people don't don't even necessarily, you know, are not even necessarily aware of his work. How do you explain this cross-cultural, what is it about his music that, that is? Well, I think some of it appeals to the European tradition, you know. He had this kind of way of almost intoning and singing the song. So that's probably why it's so popular in, across Europe, you know, in France and, and the Scandinavian countries. The chanson yeah, tradition. That, that really related the power of the words and the kind of the emotion that's in the voice. You don't really have to be able to have a melodious voice. In England, you know, it's really impossible to know why because, you know, as I say, I was a little girl when it came out and I was floored. I really was floored. And I think that, you know, immediately it kind of got into the charts. Maybe as a smaller populated country, it would make it somewhat easier to get into the charts than it would in the US. 
And uh, from that moment on, he came over early on in his career and played shows in 1970 and you know, was on the BBC, had a special on him, and was just well loved. Also, the press picked up on him. They kind of called him Laughing Len, <laughs> you know, in sort of a slightly sarcastic tones that we British tend to have when we're mad. And, um, and also uh, that they used to talk about giving away free razor blades with his, his, uh, <laughs> with his albums. I don't think they actually did. At least I don't have any, any Leonard Cohen razor blades to share with you. But for some reason or other, he just caught on. You can't always tell why, you know? Somebody's just a hit, you know? You sort of hear these things like go on in, in Denmark or something, and then something is the top of their charts. It's an American band, and you think, why him? But Leonard, I could never see why people didn't like him, because I've always loved his music. Um, and, and so a few short years after you first heard him as, as a young girl, uh, you, you decided to take on this biography. Um, <laughs> How did that come about? What, 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 what drove you to it? And what was your first thought? Of the, uh, what was your concept? I am going to do X. This is going to be about Y. Before you even did one lick of research. Why well, I did it, it sort of slightly came about after I'd done um, an interview with Leonard in 2001 in England. I was living in London then. And he'd, um, not that long before, come down from the monastery on Mount Bordy where he lived and was ordained as a Buddhist monk. He'd been there for five years. He came down and he did his first album with the New Millennium called Ten New Songs. And he was promoting it in England, sort of flanked almost as bodyguards with two of his women, you know, Sharon Robinson and Leanne Ungar, who worked with him. And we did um, interviews there. And Leonard and I did an interview that lasted one day and then it took some you know, the night off. There was no overnight. And then the next day, and then the next day. And at the end of it, I had this huge reams of transcript and thinking I had the best interview on planet Earth. You do with Leonard, you come out with a slight blush in your cheek, smoking an imaginary cigarette, you know? <laughs> Men as well as women do that. And uh, <laughs> I looked at this transcript and I thought, he's hoodwinked me again. I mean, there was some new information, but a lot of it was his wonderful way with words, which is smoke and mirrors. He's a mysterious man, a shy man. And so I thought, I started reading biographies of him at that point, and I thought, None of them capture him either. And I think at some point in my arrogance or stupidity, I thought, I want to try and get to the heart of this man. And then my natural laziness sort of kicked in. I thought, eh, this is going to be a hard job. <laughs> it's too much work. No, and so I finally did it when he did his uh, comeback tour, the 2008 tour. I just thought, he, I want to do a, a biography that has diligence and heart. And so before, before you even begin, uh, who, who is the man that you think you're going to encounter? What, what, what type of man is he? The sort of Leonard you sort of kind of know from these interviews and these biographies and these snippets that you've seen. Well, I knew he was a charmer. That much I did know, and I was sure I was going to meet a ladies' man. But I, the other stuff I wasn't sure. There were so many kind of elements and sort of what seemed to me to be parallel lines of Leonard's life. One of the things that you were talking about in your book, you know, from your book, which you can go into. But, you know, there'll be something like the religious side of his life, his family, the depression, his love of women, his absolute copious intake of drugs over the years and drink. All of these different sides, the poetry, the literature, I somehow thought it would be kind of things that maybe would cross paths here and there. And what I didn't realize at the beginning when I'd set out my little kind of roadmap of what I wanted to find out and the people who I wanted to talk to was that it was more like a helix. It was more DNA that if you took one of these strands away, the other would just completely not exist. That sounds like it makes for an extraordinarily difficult writing task, right? Because you have to contain multitudes, right? You have to hold two, three, maybe more... Uh, uh, contrasting ideas at, at your mind at all times. Uh, mm -hmm. Were there any points of, of breakdown, points where you said, I don't understand how that person who could write this beautiful thing could do this or say this terrible thing to this poor lady? W were there any, any moments of, of absolute you know, conf being confounded by the material? I had a few of those when I actually spoke to Leonard. Uh, I think it was the last time I spoke to him, the December before last, the last time before the book. 
And, and I think it just all came bursting out at one point. I said, it's such hard work being you, which kind of goes back to what Gabriel was saying, that you are. It's, it's something quite freaky. There is this life that in me for, for those sort of three intense years that I was working on the book, that there was me going about my daily business, not so well, I should hasten to add. I was getting thinner and thinner and thinner. The drink bottle was getting lower and lower and lower, you know. But... Uh, the Leonard life in me was thriving, and I could kind of make sense of what he was doing, even when he was doing things that I thought, well, that's not a very good way of behaving. So when I was in the room with him, I just said, it's so hard being you. You were just worrying about everything. And what was wrong with that woman for crying out loud? You know? <laughs> Why couldn't you stay with her? And Relationship says, advice with Leonard Cohen. And that's... he was sitting there, yeah, to himself through me. It gets very freaky, kind of Russian dolls here. And he kind of... Yes, darling, I know, but I don't live in that reality now. <laughs> <laughs> and he calls all women darling. <laughs> um, and so the man who emerged at the end was, I take it, a somewhat more complex, uh, equally as admirable figure as, as, as the man that you thought you were seeking when, when you entered the task? In some ways, more admirable. I should say an exception, I would not want to be his girlfriend. But with that exception, uh, very, and even then, they nearly all seemed to really, really like him, you know, and have nothing but good things to say. And always said he did his best. He didn't pretend to be anything other than he was. But I think more admirable, because of two things that I hadn't realized that he had at the beginning. As I say, I had my list of paths. And that was a kind of resilience and this kind of ability to survive, because... You know, the complexity, I mean, in a way, we're, you know, all of us are complex. When you examine anybody, you know, you're going to go, they did that and they did that. But, but with Leonard Cohen, the resilience to be able to get through things, because yes, he was blessed, he was born into a, you know, a loving family, uh, a well-to-do family, a supportive family. He had incredible talent, we know that. But he was also cursed, and he was cursed with restlessness, when really he did kind of want to settle down quite a lot because he needed it. And why he needed that was the other thing he was cursed with, which was depression. So he had these sort of things that were constantly working against each other. But somehow he managed to dust himself down, put his hat on, and get back out there, whatever came his way. Um, I, I won't ask you to, to recall all the magnificent moments in your book, because we would be here for a very, very long time. But, but, but I, do, I would like to insist on one. Uh, which is a moment I, I mentioned before. This is, this is during the 1970, I believe, tour in which he instructs uh, his, his road manager, Bob Johnson, uh, I would like to play a mental asylum, please. Uh, and he has this uh, absolutely astounding concert that you, in an absolutely astounding fashion, actually, actually heard, uh, unearthed for the first time. Uh, tell us both about the tour and, and the, the performance and, and about how you came to listen to it. Well, the tour, the 1970 tour, which came on the back of an album called Songs from a Room, which was his second album, it had been a big hit in England. It was top five in England. And uh, so he was sent out on a European tour. And Leonard never really toured before. He'd played the odd date, but he'd never toured. But he knew he didn't like touring. <laughs> and he was very distressed about it, to the point where he had called his best friend from Montreal, Mort Rosengarten, who is a sculptor. He's known since the age of nine, and asked him to make a mask for him. This was very curious. I remember asking what, what kind of mask? He said, you know, a mask. And I said, but you know, Richard Nixon mask, gorilla mask, tragedy comedy. He said, no, a mask of Leonard. I said, a mask of, this is getting complicated now. And apparently it was just a case of he wanted a mask of himself to hide behind. He had enough self-regard that he didn't want to hide behind anybody else. But he wanted that as an extra layer of skin and also to show a kind of that this was artifice, that the, the presentation of Leonard Cohen to the public had a certain amount of the con in it, as he'd said in the film, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Leonard Cohen. So he went on this tour, and it was marvellous, and it was the wildest tour. I mean, there were scenes where he, uh, you know, he played in Germany, and there was a guy coming down with a gun to shoot him as he was doing a Jewish dance across the stage and how Hitler salutes. He was being very provocative, was that, Leonard? And so this was a very sort of distressing but also enervating and energizing tour for him. And so this was the kind of what was going on. And he had two more dates to uh, play, two festivals. He'd come back from a US gig, which Bob Dylan was at, a very funny story there. 
but we won't go into that one. But he came back to the UK to play at the Isle of Wight Festival. The Isle of Wight is a little island off the south of England. And when I was a little girl, it was where your great aunt went. It was very civilised, <laughs> had little yachts there, and, you know, men with the sort of yachting outfits on, you know, with crest white trousers. And, um, and this had been invaded by sort of six, seven 700,000 young people for a rock festival that they were trying to make in the new, into the new Woodstock, except it was beer Woodstock with tickets and people were just invading it and not, not paying. So just before going to that concert, Leonard played a mental hospital very, very quietly, just on the outskirts, one of the suburbs of London. And yes, it was, I heard the tape on the old reel-to-reel, -reel and it was absolutely magnificent. Now, I've been hearing, you know, rumors of, of the existence of, of such a tape for, for some years now, but, but, but you actually heard that. How did you come across it? Well, this was one of those little miracles. Sometimes, you know, when you're a biographer, you get these aha moments. Other times, things are just given to you gift-wrapped. You know, this was a gift wrap, And this was a friend that I went to university with. And when I went off to be a rock chick and rock writer, he took a stupid job. He became a psychiatric social worker. So, um, and he stayed in that profession. And he just called me uh, or emailed me from London and said, you know, maybe you'd be able to answer this. But I heard that up in the north of England, there's a tape in existence of a mental hospital concert. Leonard did, have you, does this sound normal? And I said, well, let me think, I'll do some investigation. I'm sure I've heard that he did some. And it turned out that they, this thing did exist. And I called the, the, the head of that, that institution in the north of England and they said, oh, we're under instruction, nobody can hear it. We just have to keep it for safekeeping. And, uh, and they said, you know, they, they were telling me all of these things. I said, can you at least tell me the date? And so they did. So I worked out, yes, he would have been in London at that time, two days before I Love White. So uh, my friend in London just investigated further and he found the staff nurse who was working in the hospital at the time, a lovely elderly chap. And he, um, he said, yes, I've got it. But you have to come over and hear it. I live on the outskirts of London. So I went on a train to the end <coughs> of the tube line which no inner Londoner does. It's like, the end of the tube line, what happens? And he picked me up in his little car, you know, and he took me back to his house, and his wife made me tea and biscuits to dip in them. And he played me this old reel-to-reel, -reel, and it was beautiful sound. And he had said, I was an amateur recordist back then, and I asked Leonard if I could record it, and I put it at the back there, along with next to his tape recorder, and, and we did that. And, and what's the concert like? Wonder, oh, I also got this poor old man to draw, a di you know, whole diagrams of where people would have been in the room and who sang where. It was absolutely amazing. It was pretty much the whole of the Isle of Wight set. They were warming up with a song that's never been released uh, by Leonard Cohen, and uh, that was really something to be able to hear as well, the arms of Regina. And, um, and they just did this excellent concert. What was the most valuable thing for me was to hear all the things he was saying between the songs because he had this very small captive audience, you know, just a very tiny room. And he just opened up and, you know, he started saying, like, you know, I really feel comfortable talking to loonies. <laughs> You're a real hard bunch of nuts. And, and started talking about his own experiences, you know, and also about his, uh, at that time, slightly floundering relationship with Marianne Ilhan, the, the inspiration for so long Marianne. So he was much more open because this wasn't a public display. So I can, uh, probably that's why they put uh, a little note that it shouldn't be played to inquiring journalists like me. Alongside uh, the, the preoccupation publicly with, um, with mental illness, which, which is mm -hmm. a recurrent theme in, in this small world of ours of, of Cohen fanatics, um, there's also, or seemingly, a preoccupation with religion. Uh, there's, there's talk about the role Judaism played in his life uh, and about the role uh, Zen played in his life and, and whether or not these two are, um, these two are compatible. How do, how, how do you see Leonard Cohen's religion? I know it's an unfair question, so, <laughs> so any religion. sort of meditation would be. Ah, okay. Well, certainly his background and the fact that he was a Cohen and that his family was one of the, one of the kind of more important high status Jewish families in Canada, particularly in Montreal, was very, very important to him. And you know the story. I mean, you could probably tell it just as well that, you know, his, his great-grandfather, so Lazarus, 
You're puzzled. Uh, it's still, you know, it's still such a such an odd combination to me of, to to contain again mm -hmm. these multitudes of, of 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 commitment to Jewish tradition and and inhabit mm. the Zen idea. Well, I tell you what. Rather than giving the history uh, of Leonard's family and everything, but it's more, I'll I'll stick to that point of it because it is very interesting. Really, um, Leonard said that there was absolutely no problem with being a Buddhist and a Jew because being it, being a Buddhist wasn't, didn't have a god, it wasn't theistic, and you know, it was more of a pursuit of discipline. And discipline is a very important thing to Leonard. I think it partly came about because of his depression, and you know, anybody with depression knows that just doing things and doing things regularly helps an awful lot. And he was also looking for answers. Even though he didn't want to rebel or turn his back on his background, he was no Bob Dylan, he didn't change his name, he didn't kind of find Jesus. He said, I always loved Jesus, but I never stood up and shouted it out on the shore. That's what he said about that. <laughs> but um, so he, uh, you know, he was very grounded in who he was, and it's a very, very important part of his life. But he followed all sorts of pursuits. When he lived on Hydra in 1960, the expat, uh, expat artist community there, and writer community, was very much into sort of I Ching's and Scientology and all of these other kind of things that were going on. He tried pretty much everything. He, when he moved back to New York, he tried Scientology. In fact, I found in his archives a certificate to show that he did go clear. He is an operating thetan, or whatever the appropriate term is for that. And so he can have special chats with Tom Cruise with one trouser leg rolled up, you know, <laughs> the handshake. But he left it very, very early on. But it seemed to me that what he was seeking was a kind of answer, a way to live, because as he described it to me, that you know, the kind of depression he had was that he woke up every morning thinking, how do I get through this? What combination of wine, drugs, women's song will get me through this day? It was that desperate. And the Buddhism thing was something he went to almost like a kind of top-up, you know, for years, for almost 30 years before he moved to the monastery. Also, the other thing besides discipline is study. It seemed that Leonard was kind of addicted to study, other than when he was at Columbia doing his <laughs> postgraduate. Other he, than when he was at university, <laughs> When he was course. at university. Yeah. But outside of the university, study has been a very, very big part of his life. So I think those are the things. He's trying to find answers, you know? So it doesn't stop him being a Jew, and you know, he's written a poem, I am a Jew, to let people know that he's definitely a Jew, but he's got these other, you know, these other pursuits. And in the end, he, after, what I was shocked to find was, after I actually went up to this monastery and stayed there two days, how Leonard lasted five years, I don't know. But uh, <laughs> I just assumed, like everybody else, that when he came back down from the monastery in 1999, he was cured of depression. But when I had the last conversations with him for the book, he said, I left the monastery because I couldn't stay there a minute longer. I was too depressed. So he went on and found a, another teacher to study with in Mumbai, India, and was going backwards and forwards for years, for periods of time, to study uh, a core Vedanta, basically, Hinduism. Um, it, it would be obscene uh, to ask about Hallelujah, but it would be obscene not to. Uh, Bring it up. So, so many versions. Uh, he himself famously declared a moratorium. Uh, it's in the movie Shrek. It's in superhero movies. It's on American Idol. It's everywhere you look. Uh, and uh, suddenly, I mean, the song has been out for, for so long. Why? Why? Isn't that an amazing thing? I know. It's, it's, it's over 300 recorded versions. But why is, what is so odd is it often happens with Leonard. He writes a song with one kind of mood and one kind of feel, one kind of lyric, and then it becomes something else. I mean, the people who now tackle it on the talent shows, you know, your American idols and everything, they just treat it as a kind of Beyonce workout kind of song, you know. <laughs> and, you know, Leonard does it in a kind of very, you know, very slow, measured way. And the lyrics, you know, aren't necessarily about glory, as you know, it's about writing a song. It goes like this, the fourth or fifth. It's about naked people, it's about sex, not having sex, wanting sex, the usual Leonard things, religion. It has all these elements that don't usually make for a great pop tune. It does have, though, a one-word chorus and a very catchy one-word mm. chorus that, you know, a drunk in a midnight choir, to quote Leonard, mm -hmm. could probably knock off, you know, after a few whiskeys. Want sex? Think about religion. Leonard Cohen. Um, <laughs> 
I, I think the most, the most befitting way uh, to transition into questions and answers is, is, is to ask you uh, to, to pick up that gorgeous instrument. Oh, and, I'm not going to play Hallelujah. Us. There's a moratorium on that. <laughs> no, thing. absolutely not Hallelujah. Uh, 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 but but any, anything else in the repertoire, since you're also a musician, uh, right. we would be very grateful. Well, I think, you know, this is great now. I get a roadie and a salmon, because if I move from here, I'll pull out. I think, am I going to pull this out? <laughs> I love this service. Oba, Isn't this Oba. good? I'm coming back. Yeah. All I'm actually right. wearing black to do this, but that's okay. Yeah, you should. And with a heavy metal t-shirt <laughs> next time, please. Motorhead would be good. Shall we see if it's in tune or are you going to tune it for me? No, I don't do that. Don't, they don't do it. It's hard to get help, really, isn't it? <laughs> God, this might be a little bit close, but I'll try my best without kicking it. Since this is New York, I'll do a New York song, except it was one that even though it was about New York, he recorded it when he was living in a log cabin in Tennessee. I tell you, pursuing Leonard's life was very interesting. The, the, the cabin, thanks to friends who helped try and track it down for me, no longer exists, but it was at the end of a long dirt road, and there were pea fowl and all sorts of strange animals around, and an old moonshiner living down the road who'd been um, in prison for murdering a policeman. Anyway, that was his friend from back there. But this was recorded in Nashville, it's the least country song you can imagine, I imagine. And uh, it's about New York. It's four in the morning, the end of December. Writing you now just to see if you're better. New York is cold, but I like where I'm living. There's music on Clinton Street all through the evening. I hear that you're building your little house deep in. Desert. You're living for nothing now. I hope you're keeping some kind of record. Yes, and Jane came by with a lock of your hair. She said that she gave it to her. The night that you planned to go clear. Did you ever go clear? Well, the last time we saw you, you looked so much older. Your famous blue raincoat was torn at the shoulder. You've been to the station to read every train And you came home without Lily Marling And you treated my woman To a flake of your life And when she came back She was nobody's wife Well, I see you There were the rose in your teeth One more thin gypsy thief Well, I see James away Sends her regards. Well, what can I tell you? My brother, my killer. What can I possibly say? I guess that I miss you. I 
guess I forgive you, I'm glad you stood in my way. If you ever come by here, the chain off for me. Well, your enemy is sleeping, and his woman is free. Yes, and thanks for the trouble you took from her eyes. I thought it was there for good, so I never. When Jane came by with a lock of your hair, she said that she gave it to her the night that you planned to go clear. Sincerely, El Cohen. Thank you.